This is a production of Cornell University. Thanks, Johannes. So thank you, everyone, for coming here today. Um, as Johannes said, this is what I've done for the past, I guess, maybe four years out of the past six years that I've been here. And, um, and uh, it's basically uh, looking at the influ influences or impacts of uh, applications of bio, even though coming through uh, humans originally, uh, black carbon in the landscapes. And again, this is in Western Kenya mostly. So just as an introduction, I want to, to just frame some of the nomenclature here because I do skip around a little bit depending upon the application. So pyrogenic carbon, this is carbon that has been derived from the process of pyrolysis. And, um, and this is more of an overarching uh, name for a bunch of different types uh, than of, of pyrogenic carbon. And so within pyrogenic carbon, I'm defining things based upon their intentionality. So then biochar is pyrogenic carbon that was intentionally manufactured for agricultural purposes. And then charcoal then, of course, is pyrogenic carbon that has been intentionally manufactured as a solid fuel. Um, and then you'll see often pyrogenic carbon is also used with as black carbon in some of the literature. But in this case, we want to differentiate maybe some of the soots and aerosols that are often encapsulated within uh, black carbon. Uh, and remove those, and so pyrogenic carbon is basically those minus the, the soots and aerosols. So uh, as uh, part of the other introduction, so we've seen, there have been quite a lot of uh, publications and, and, um, and instances of applications or pyrogenic carbon influencing uh, crop yields, often positively influencing crop yields. So this one comes from a, the really famous sites down in Brazil, the Terra Preta. Uh, this one here comes from us in, um, in Kenya, of course, looking at uh, beans and then legumes. And then another one, uh, this is what I did for my master's, and a lot of you might know um, some of the work that has come out of this department with the Chrono Sequence Project in Western Kenya. Also looking at uh, applications of biochar and impacts with crop yields. However, uh, a lot of the mechanistic, well, before I get to that point, so here's a, a, a nice graph looking at uh, then biochar publications over the past about a decade or so, and so just for reference, my in initial uh, coming into Cornell was in 2008, so this is about the annual publications in biochar, and over the past couple of years, it's really grown exponentially. So the knowledge is, is being built rapidly you know, every year, um, but despite that, there's, there still tends to be a lack of mechanistic approaches to biochar and pyrogenic work um, in the published literature. So we have these large in influences in crop yields and in some environmental uh, Im impacts, but we don't really understand what's really happening at mechanistically on the rhizosphere. And so one of the things that I, I'm hoping to do with this presentation is to look at the mechanistic responses of biochar to biological nitrogen fixation. And then following that, if we get some positive responses, what are the implications for moving to intentionally applying biochar or other pyrogenic carbons uh, at the larger scale across the landscapes. And so this is also something that's really lacking from literature. And so we hope to, to, to tackle this also by looking at movements of natural pyrogenic carbon within the landscape. So moving into the first chapter, uh, here we want to focus on um, the, the individual components within biochar and then how that will affect biological nitrogen fixation in tropical soils. So some of the impetus for this project was that there's been uh, one really nice um, paper that came out a couple years ago looking at the impacts between uh, biochar application and biological nitrogen fixation. However, there's really, this is the really one of the only studies that you can find in the literature looking at this. And then the mechanisms are, are not really known. Um, in this paper by Rondon, they, they tend to tie it to uh, nutrient application or nutrients that were in the biochar in the minerals and that maybe influenced um, nitrogen fixation. But it was really left uh, as a black box. And so uh, this is a nice graph that, that looks at the, the different biochemical and chemical constituents within biochar. So uh, we, we now are more uh, aware that biochar isn't really a specific um, thing. It's more of a continuum of processes and products depending upon one would be the relative proportions of individual biomolecules in the feedstocks. And so here we have amorphous hemicellulose, crystalline cellulose, and then amorphous lignin. So this is in the unprocessed 
feedstocks. And then these proportions are, of course, changed depending upon what kind of feedstock we're talking about. And then once we pyrolyze them, so the pyrolysis, the intensity, so that basically the temperature increasing here on the x-axis, when we move across the pyrolysis intensity, we get a, a really a change in a fundamental rearrangement of these materials. And so if you look down here, we have um, on the top part, this, this white area is the pore space. This gray area, the small little gray bar here, then is ash content. So this would be minerals, calcium, magnesium, potassium, silica, etc. Here, this medium gray in the middle is the volatile material. And at the very bottom is what's called pyrogenic carbon or fixed carbon. And, this, uh, and these three things change. The proportions uh, relatively, relative to each other change as uh, temperatures increase. And typically, the, the limit for what we'd apply intentionally to agricultural fields would be around 300 degrees Celsius. And towards the maximum would be around 600 degrees Celsius. And so these are what we would typically think to be uh, relatively good chars or have biochars that would have a positive impact in, in agricultural productivity. <clears throat> so what we wanted to do, then we wanted to see how each of these uh, particular components of the biochar, uh, one uh, would affect uh, the biological nitrogen fixation and how uh, we could manipulate these depending upon feedstock, depending on uh, uh, pyrolysis intensity, and also depending upon maybe some post-treatments. And so some of our hypotheses were that one, the fertilization response from the ash minerals going into the soil from the biochar would only be partially responsible for some of the increases in biological nitrogen fixation. Our second hypothesis was that the volatile material of the biochar will stimulate some of the responses in the rhizobium. So we did this in a greenhouse experiment, and this was conducted in Kenya. <coughs> the soil that we used was uh, under long-term agricultural uh, production for over 100 years. It was an ultasol with relatively no nutrient content, but the pH was just slightly acidic at 6.1. We used uh, a bean variety that came from Siat that was sensitive to uh, uh, nutrient responses in the soils. And it was also had a, a, nitrogen f uh, a nodulating and non-nodulating isoline. So we were able to partition out the uh, amounts and quantify of, of the biological nitrogen fixation. Uh, then in this case, we used the native rhizobium, so we did not add an inoculant. We used whatever was in the soil, and we added biochar at the equivalent rate of 15 tons per hectare. And then across all of our treatments, we added a basal fertilizer phosphorus application of the equivalent of one kilogram per hectare to sort of uh, eliminate maybe some of the uh, absolute deficiencies uh, in phosphorus. So with our biochar feedstocks, we chose a variety of feedstocks that all came from Western Kenya. Uh, a couple of them were woody materials, so these were Eucalyptus saligna and Dilanux regia, which are both trees. In addition to that, we used uh, tea twigs, so these are twigs, the woody twigs that are coming from the tea bush. Uh, we used rice hulls, sugarcane bagasse, maize stovers, and maize cobs. And for pyrolysis intensities, we used uh, low temperature and high temperature, so 350 and 550 degrees Celsius. And then in addition to this, we wanted to manipulate the chars as they came out of the kiln or maybe when they were in the kiln. And so we'd, one of the, the ways we did this was to not do anything at all, so just take it right out of the kiln and, and use it in our experiment. Another one was to use steam. So we injected steam during pyrolysis, and this is the, what's commonly used, the common method that's used to manufacture, um, uh, so this is a black carbons for adsorption. And, um, uh, and so what, we, what this typically does is it blows out the volatile material, also blows out some of, the, um, uh, some of the volatile materials. Oh, I'm sorry. So the steam, this is used to make activated carbons, which is a subset, of course, of black carbon. And then we used, uh, another one was acetone. So after the biochar was manufactured, we leached it with acetone to selectively remove some of the volatile materials. And so the volatile materials typically have a oily or a tarry consistency, and so they're they tend to be more soluble in, uh, in solvents such as acetone. And then finally, we used HCl, a dilute HCl, um, to leach out and dissolve some of the minerals that were held in, in within the ash components. And then afterwards, with the HCl treatment, we adjusted the pH back to the original pH of, this, of the biochar when it came out of the, of the kiln. And then Within the, all the pots, we added um, water and maintained everything at field capacity, and then we harvested them approximately six <coughs> weeks after planting. So here are some of the first results. 
So this is biomass. On the bottom, in this uh, medium gray, this is shoot biomass. And then in the light gray in the middle is root biomass. And at the very top is uh, nodule biomass. And we found really um, quite dramatic and significant increases in all metrics of biomass um, with the additions of our biochars relative to their controls. So here's moving also with biomass, but now we're looking at the, uh, the post-pyrolysis treatments. So with results uh, regarding biomass, we did not find any significant differences between any of our post-pyrolysis treatments. Now this is different pyrolysis temperatures. We also did not find any significant differences in uh, biomass uh, with our post-pyrolysis temperatures, or with our pyrolysis temperatures. So this graph, this series of graphs, then looks at the nitrogen fixation and also nodulation. So on this axis, we have number of nodules. And then on this axis, we have nitrogen derived from fixation as both a, total percent, a percentage of total nitrogen and an uh, absolute magnitude of, of milligrams nitrogen fixed per plant. And uh, in this case, we saw really some uh, significant differences in nitrogen fixation and nodulation uh, <coughs> between all of our biochars and between the biochars and our controls. In this case, looking at post-pyrolysis treatments, we found some significant differences wherever we added acetone, we got a bump up in nodulation and nitrogen fixation. This is also true uh, with our high temperature biochars. So our high temperature biochars gave us a stronger significant response over our lower temperature biochars. So then we're trying to correlate uh, what of the constituencies within the biochar resulted in these changes. And we did this by first looking at principal component analysis. Um, and then we, well actually we, before this we did a multiple linear regression. Once we took the significant uh, factors that were coming out of the multiple linear regression, we, we ran that in a principal component analysis. And we found that uh, nodulation, nodule biomass, and nitrogen derived from fixation were principally uh, correlated to foliar plant uh, uh, phosphorus and plant phosphorus uptake. We also found that the phosphorus uptake and foliar P were not correlated to biochar P so that the plants were getting more phosphorus, but this phosphorus wasn't really coming from the biochar. So we wanted to do a follow-up experiment to see if we could tease out some of these um, complexities. And, and so this is a series of uh, table, actually one table uh, that we'll be looking at and just wanted to walk you through everything. So on the top here, we have two of the biochars that we saw previously. Uh, these two were the ones that had the highest and the lowest nutrient contents. And so these were Dillonux and eucalyptus biochars. And then below that we have our controls. And so we used uh, a no fertilizer control, which we saw before. And this time we have a fertilized control, which the fertilizer had phosphorus and potassium and also had uh, micronutrients that were equivalent to the same rate that we found in the highest biochar that we had, which was Dillonix. And then in addition to that, we have our acid treated biochars, so the biochars that had um, low nutrient contents that were, that were leached out. And we had these at both a high native pH and a low native pH. And these are also in, in comparison to the same controls that we found up here. Uh, and so on the top then, of course, we have a number of nod nodules. We have nitrogen drive from fixation, as we saw before. And in this case, we found similar responses. So wherever we added the biochar, we got uh, greater, um, greater nitrogen fixation and nodulation over our controls. And in this case, we measured mycorrhizal root colonization. And with that, we found that there was significantly greater mycorrhizal root colonization with the added biochars over our, both of our controls. And looking at the acidic versus basic biochar, we found that the acidic biochar still had greater nitrogen derived from fixation uh, over our fertilized control. Another follow-up that we did is we wanted to look more closely at the volatile materials and the influence of the volatiles on the native rhizobium, or not native rhizobium, but rhizobium. And so what we did is we took the volatile extracts that we had from our, our uh, biochars, the acetone-soluble volatile extracts, and then we uh, incorporated that into yeast mannitol auger growth plates. And then we, <coughs> using a drop plate method, 
we added uh, rhizobium, cultured rhizobium, and then grew them in an incubation experiment. And what we found was that the acetone extracts with the low temperature biochars across the board gives very poor responses uh, with rhizobial growth. So we got below the method detection limit for all of the low temperature biochars. We found this also to be true with one of the high temperature biochars. So the biochar manufactured um, from maize stover at the high temperature also gave us a really poor response in rhizobial growth. But then when we looked at the acetone soluble volatile extracts from the high temperature biochars, almost all of them gave us no significant differences from the controls. So whether we added them or whether we didn't add them, they were the same. The rhizobium basically did not have any, any, um, have any significant effect on rhizobial growth, both negative or positive. But with two of the extracts, so the ones coming from Dillinux and rice at the high temperatures, we actually found greater rhizobial growth than with the control. So that the additions of these resulted in a boost in rhizobial growth. So then conclusions uh, relating to our, our first hypothesis um, that was related to nutrients in the biochar, we found that the biochars, w uh, the nutrients in the biochar was important. So whenever we uh, leached out the nutrients from the biochar using HCL, we got a decrease in our responses. But this wasn't sufficient. Um, when we had the acidic leached biochars, these were still giving us a better response than, a, than the fertilized only control. And then again, we got greater phosphorus uptake was the prim seems to be the primary driving variable for what the responses that we saw. But this was not um, correlated strongly to biochar phosphorus. So what we were thinking is that the res greater responses with the mycorrhiza was then leading to greater, um, greater uh, looking of them and excavation of the mycorrhiza in the soil for phosphorus and that was then funneling into the plant. pH was also beneficial. Whenever we added the acidic biochars, we got a decrease from the basic biochars. But again, this wasn't sufficient. So the acidic uh, biochars still gave us greater responses over the both of the controls. Then finally, our last hypothesis related to volatile material. So some of them definitely were detrimental um, that we saw. Some of them were neutral, and then some of them actually gave us a positive. So we're not quite sure at the moment why that might be. Um, it might be that they're, they were feeding off some of these materials, or maybe there's some sort of, um, of bioactive molecules in there. We're not really uh, quite sure, but we, we do know that, that volatile materials can't all be treated the same, that there is really a variable and a, a variation in responses. Okay, so now we're switching gears. Uh, we're still uh, looking at beans and nodulation, but in this case, we're looking at the influence of biochar to mediate against drought stress um, with rhizobium in the soil. So and again, our objectives were to look at the, the physical properties of biochar to increase uh, then um, water availability under induced drought stress conditions. And our hypotheses, the first hypothesis was that the porosity of the biochar will provide a uh, refuge um, for the microorganisms, that this refuge then be, have a higher water potential than in the surrounding soil. And our second hypothesis was that this effect will be greater, will be uh, expressed more under uh, sandier soils than in clayer soils. So we also did this in a greenhouse experiment in Kenya. We used the same soil that we used in the previous experiment except in this case we added another treatment where we had pure uh, acid washed quartz sand and then we did sequential mixtures of the two. In this case we did not use the native rhizobium. We added uh, an inoculant, so this was C899, which is a variety of rhizobium tropici, and we used three different carriers. So the first carrier we used was raw bagasse um, that came from sugarcane manufacturing. Our second carrier was biochar that was produced from the spagasse that we manufactured it at 550 degrees Celsius. And then the, the third carrier was portions of the soil that used as a control carrier for the in inoculants. And then finally, we, used, uh, we designed our inoculants so that the inoculants that we added matched the MPN of the soils so that we're trying not to boost the total population of soil uh, rhizobium, but rather just augment it with using this carrier. And to our knowledge, C899 had not been used in the soil, had not been introduced into the soil before. So then the idea was to use C899 as a biomarker uh, 
as a, so that we could figure out how these effects were working. So we introduced three water regimes. So the first water regime was no water stress. And in this regime, we incorporated the inoculant into the soil, and then we watered the field capacity, and then we planted. The second uh, water stress was a little more intense, where we incorporated our inoculant, we watered the field capacity, then we allowed it to dry for eight weeks, then watered back to field capacity and planted. And then our third uh, water stress was, was our greatest water stress, where we incorporated the inoculant, watered to field capacity, dried it for a week, watered it again to field capacity, and then dried it, and then repeated this wetting and drying cycle for eight weeks. And then finally, we watered it again to field capacity, and then we planted. So our initial results, uh, this is looking at biomass. Uh, so shoot biomass, that is. Um, what we found is what we expected, that shoot biomass decreases as our sand content increases. So on the x-axis here, we have percent soil, so 100% soil, 100% sand, or yeah, so 0% soil, 100% sand. And uh, this was true across all of our um, water stresses. We got some variable responses uh, with shoot biomass in regards to the inoculant carrier that we added. In no water stress, in pure sand, we found a significant response with biochar versus the other carriers. And the rest of the soils, there was no significant differences in the responses. In our light water stress, the only significant difference that we found was a greater response in shoot biomass with our control over the bagasse and in the biochar carriers. Then finally, under our most intense water stress, uh, on the pure soil and then the 75% soil treatments, we found that the biochar was the one that gave us the greatest uh, significant response with shoot biomass. Now here we're looking at the same soils but, um, and water treatments, but, but focusing on nodulation. In this case, we got very different responses. Our bagasse gave us the most significant, and really across the board and across almost all of the water treatments, greater nodulation versus everything else, either the control or the biochar. The only exception was under no drought stress uh, in the pure sand uh, treatment, we found significant uh, greater and significant differences in nodulation in response to our biochar amendment. And here's nodule biomass. Nodule biomass follows the same trends that we saw with, nodu with, um, with nodulation. Uh, Bagasse was giving us the greatest uh, significant positive responses, except for in that one soil, the sand, and the no drought stress where we got greater significant um, responses with the biochar. Next, what we wanted to do is we wanted to take the nodules and look inside of them to see uh, what the occupancy was, whether it was indeed what we added under with 899 or whether it was some of the native strains. And so we did DNA fingerprinting. And one of the things that we found was it was really quite difficult to get um, uh, any culturable uh, organisms from these nodules. But when we did get them, we found that there really wasn't any significant differences in the proportions of 899 versus the natives with either our bagasse or our biochar uh, treatments. And what we did find was that the actual proportions we're getting were relatively low. So zero to 14% of the nodules were the ones that we added with 899. Uh, with the biochar, with the bagasse, 10 to 23% of the nodules were, ha were 899. So what we take from this, uh, g this, these tables here are that the nodules are really dominated by the natives and not dominated <coughs> By, uh, by our introduced strains. So in conclusion, uh, the biochar and porosity, we did not find this to be true. Um, the bagasse was giving us the greatest significant changes in rhizobium uh, with ir really irrespective of most of our water treatments. <coughs> One of the reasons that we're thinking for this is that we, we didn't find really significant differences in the in our significant numbers of in the introduced strains, so the 899 that we added to the soil. So what's most likely happening here is the bagasse is, is, is adding a boost to the native strains of rhizobium rather than maintaining the introduced strains through the drought stress. And so some of the literature that we've been pulling up was relating what happens if you added some sugars, so simple sugars, <coughs> excuse me, um, to the soil, you get a, a boost in the native strains of rhizobium. 
the bagasse being a, a byproduct of sugarcane processing industry, it has relatively high residual sugars. And so we most likely what we're thinking is that the residual sh these residual sugars are the ones that are res responsing, are, uh, that are causing the response in the native rhizobium in the soil. And then finally, th what about the, r the differences, the significant differences in the biochar with the sandy soil? And so what we might, might be seeing here is the greater buffering capacity of biochar. We did not find any significant differences in the pH between the treatments. But that does not necessarily mean that the biochar uh, wasn't able to, to moderate the, the chemical conditions within the soil. There's been a lot of papers that showed uh, buffering capacity of biochar to be really quite high, and, and it seems like this might be the most likely uh, reasoning for what we've been seeing. Then finally, with uh, regards to the shoot biomass, um, I, it seems like, based upon our previous study and looking at this study, that it might be linked to greater mi m uh, nutrient uptake or possibly um, nutrient allocation through mycorrhizal foraging. So now we're switching gears totally to the last chapter. And here we're looking at landscape scale uh, depositions and movement across uh, of black carbon, or I'm sorry, of pyrogenic carbon uh, across uh, uh, landscapes at the small scale and also landscapes at the larger scale. So there's been quite a couple of studies that have documented <coughs> preferential loss of pyrogenic carbon, soil pyrogenic carbon in the literature. And these have both come from agricultural landscapes, which is Rumpel and, uh, and her colleagues in 2006, and from natural landscapes. And this was Guggenberger and his colleagues in 2008. In addition to that, there's been some evidence of large scale mechanistic coupling between pyrogenic carbon and total organic carbon on the, la on the landscapes. And so here, uh, Jaffe looked uh, at global rivers, at the, at the exports of pyrogenic carbon and total carbon from global rivers, and they found a, a really strong and, and significant correlation between the two. However, um, there's really no process-based linkages between what people have been seeing at the smaller landscapes in agriculture and the nature, and also at the global landscapes with rivers. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to quantify both the magnitude and the pathways of terrestrial black carbon uh, loss and, and translocations within the landscape as <coughs> a response from initial fire event. And we also wanted to see if we can take a stab at identifying the mechanisms for these movements within the landscape. So our hypothesis was one, that erosion would be the dominant pathway for terrestrial black carbon loss in the landscape and that pyrogenic carbon would be, would be preferentially eroded from the landscapes. So we did this by using um, some of the, the paired watershed studies that have uh, <coughs> been established within this department over the past couple of years um, in Western Kenya. And if I don't know if you remember John Recha, this is what he did for his entire PhD. So what we have here is a pair of forested watersheds, a pair of watersheds that were converted into agriculture relatively recently, so 2001, a pair of watersheds that were converted uh, in the medium term, so in the early 90s, and a pair of watersheds that were converted from the native forest uh, in the 1950s. So we were fortunate, but also unfortunate for the landscape to have um, uh, been able to monitor and evaluate the initial deposition of black carbon in the forested landscape. So in, in this early, uh, early 2012, the local population and communities began the process of clearing um, one of our forested watersheds, and then they used the woods, the trees, once they were cleared, um, to create charcoal. So what we saw is, is really the initial, um, the initial deposition, what most likely occurred over the past 60 years in these soils. And this wasn't uh, what was classically defined as a slash and burn, where the entire landscape is cut down and burnt. Rather, it's a, a chop and char. So the, the trees are chopped down, piled together, <coughs> and then pyrolyzed to create charcoal for export in very specific locations located throughout the landscape. So here are some of the land use maps that we created for these watersheds. Again, on, on this panel, we have the young agricultural watersheds medium agricultural <coughs> watersheds and old agricultural watersheds. And one of the things that I would like to point out is that the land use change um, does occur and does change between the different uh, conversion ages. So we get a predominance of maize cultivation 
here, and then as we move over time, we get a more and more change into um, perennial crops. I know that I didn't include the key, but this green area is maize, and these this um, this green spotted area are is uh, tea, and also some woodlots that we have here. So we took these landscapes and we 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 divided them divided them into slope units. So these are uh, this would be uh, summits, and then shoulders, and then <coughs> Uh, <coughs> toe slopes, foot slopes, foot slopes, then toe slopes. And so we divided these across all the landscapes and really used this for doing some of our, our sub subsequent analysis. And so then within these different uh, uh, Katina landscape positions, we found we, we uh, randomly located four different spots across the landscapes then to sample for soil and for other things. Oh, I want to put out that on these sides, so each of the watersheds, we have we established a weir, which we took both um, hydrological data and also water samples from them. So across those, those landscape positions that I showed you, we sampled soil to two meters depth. We used the Cornell Sprinkle Infiltrometer to measure infiltration and erosion rates. We also captured any erosion that we found for some subsequent analysis. <coughs> And then at the weirs, we measured bi-monthly stream, uh, stream water concentrations in uh, pyrogenic carbon and also total organic carbon. And then in addition to that, so that was the smaller landscape. Across the larger landscape, uh, we measured uh, stream water concentrations of pyrogenic carbon and total carbon that were in most of the major rivers that are feeding into Lake Victoria. So these are included here in the green. Um, for reference, our smaller watersheds are located up here in the red, and we also measured at the only outlet for the Nile of Lake Victoria um, there in Jinja in Uganda, which is highlighted in blue. So in these uh, rivers, we sampled, uh, randomly sampled five times uh, in one day, though, uh, water from the rivers, and then we took these the five 20-liter uh, samples homogenized them and took a one 20 liter subsample and we acidified that for transportation. And then once we took the water samples uh, back to Cornell, we freeze dried them and then we took the solids and analyzed them along with our soils on uh, a subsample under, under high pi. So this is a hydrogen pyrolysis, which is a really good instrument that can get us uh, quantitative measurements for both <coughs> pyrogenic carbon and total organic carbon. And then in addition to that, we took uh, the rest of the samples and measured pyrogenic carbon and um, total organic carbon using FTAR. And then use, using the uh, uh, partial least squares analysis, we did a regression to make a predictive model for black, uh, pyrogenic carbon and total organic carbon uh, for the rest of our samples. So here's some of the results. This is uh, with depth. These are total organic carbon and non-pyrogenic carbon. And this really follows what we would expect. Uh, in the surface, we have really <coughs> high concentrations of these carbon species, and the concentrations decrease with depth. Now here we're looking at soil pyrogenic carbon, and then also the ratio of pyrogenic carbon to total carbon. With the total um, pyrogenic carbon, what we're finding is the same thing we saw before. Actually, this is up here, where we get our greatest concentrations on the surface, and then we get a decrease with depth. But unlike what we saw before, uh, with the ratio of pyrogenic carbon to total carbon, we found an increase in this ratio with depth. So we're getting an enrichment in pyrogenic carbon with depth in the soil. Here we're also looking at soils, except we're looking at only surface soils, and now we're looking across the different catchments, so moving from the forest to the old agricultural landscapes. And one of the things that we see here is uh, in the forest, we're seeing really kind of a random distribution of total organic carbon and non-pyrogenic carbon across the landscape um, within the forested catchments. But with pyrogenic carbon, as I mentioned before, we're really seeing very site-specific increases in pyrogenic carbon. So these are the areas where the charcoal was, was manufactured. As we move into the young agricultural catchment with total organic carbon and non-pyrogenic carbon, we see an increase 
in the concentrations and the total amounts of these carbon species uh, along the topo sequence. So we see a decrease in the upper, uh, the upper positions of the slopes, and we see uh, an increase in the lower positions along the foot slopes. This was not true with the ratio of pyrogenic carbon to uh, total carbon. What we're seeing is greater uh, concentrations of pyrogenic carbon higher in the slope positions. When we move to the medium uh, conversions, so these are the, the ones that were converted in the 1990s, this, uh, all the significance moves, all this, this interaction really disappears. And so we see uh, really a uniform distribution of these carbon species across the, the catchments. <coughs> and then we move to the old conversions, the old catchments, you start to pick up then significant changes and significant increases in pyrogenic carbon. Here again, we're seeing concentrations of pyrogenic carbon relative to uh, non-pyrogenic carbon in the higher slope positions across the landscape. This data is the, our, our data that we got from uh, the, the sprinkle infiltrometer, so looking at erosion. And what we see, uh, I want to draw your attention to, again, the proportion of pyrogenic carbon to total carbon. We don't see any increase, any significant increase in this ratio across any of our, our sites from the areas where we found really high pyrogenic carbon to the areas where we found really low pyrogenic carbon. So this is giving us some evidence that we are not finding preferential erosion of pyrogenic carbon. So here we're looking at um, total, <coughs> total carbon and pyrogenic carbon and non-pyrogenic carbon exports from stream waters from these catchments. And what we're finding here is that uh, we get a really a, a, our greatest export is happening young in the conversion process, and then it gets greater and greater and greater, and then after which it goes back down again as the carbon, of course, is lost across the landscapes. But we're not finding any clear trend with pyrogenic carbon. So our, our proportions of carbon isn't really changing very much, apart from this one outlier, isn't really changing much across the landscape. I would like to point out um, that the global average for all these is around 3.5, and so I'll be using that in the next slide. So here we're looking at um, the same thing, so exports and concentrations of these carbon species, but then looking at the larger landscapes, and so these large rivers that are flowing into Lake Victoria. And really the main point that I want to show here is that the ratio then of pyrogenic carbon to total carbon is staying relatively constant with some uh, fluctuations, but what we find is that what we the proportion that we found in our headwater catchments are the same proportion that we found in the coming out of the Yala River. So the headwater catchments were the headwaters to the Yala River. So really we're seeing the same ratio, whether it's coming from a small scale to a large scale of pyrogenic carbon to total carbon coming out. And so Again, I think this is greater evidence that we're not finding preferential erosion of pyrogenic carbon into the landscape um, through rivers at the small scale and also moving to the large scale. And so in conclusion, I think that the evidence um, is, is leading us to believe that preferential erosion of pyrogenic carbon is not seen across scales, and we might actually be seeing preferential erosion of non-pyrogenic carbon in the landscape, contrary to what was published in the literature previously. And we found that these losses were greatest in the first 10 years after conversion, after which uh, things tend to stabilize in the system. Uh, and finally, this suggests that there's low possibility of preferential losses of intentionally applied biochar at scale. So if we were to think about applying uh, biochar uh, in agricultural systems at a, a large scale across landscapes, the, the, the really the, the, the um, the possibility of preferential erosion of this applied biochar being a, um, a potential large uh, 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 monetary and time effort in, in getting out there would be relatively low based upon our data. So thank you very much. I would like to thank Johannes and the rest of the members of my committee and uh, my lab team for really being support of, really being in a lot of support over the past couple of years. <coughs> this has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.